Hello, my name is Bill Choi. Um, welcome to the 2018 Survey of Equipment webinar. Um, this is something we're doing for the first time. It's a little bit newer. It's going to be a little bit different than the last time we've done it, where we just kind of went over the results of the survey. Um, my name is Bill Choi. I'm the Vice President of Research, and I'll be delivering this webinar, moderating this webinar. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, the Survey of Equipment Finance Activity has been around since 1974. It started out as a 15-page document in 2018. The CETA was about 368 pages long. With so much information available, um, it can be overwhelming. And about three years ago, ELFA decided to take the initiative and start to digitize the survey. We wanted to make sure the CEFA report was um, more user-friendly to the member and be able to customize um, their data and what they were looking for. So that's one of the things we've done. Uh, Technology-wise, the best the best way to access the webinar is through the web link and ask for the computer to dial for your um, for audio. Um, it's interactive. If you have a question, please use the chat uh, with presenter option at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over the bottom, a so, uh, chat option will pop up. Um, I'll continuously monitor the questions throughout the session, and there'll be time at the end to at, at the at the at the end of the webinar to ask questions. Uh, today's presenters, um, we have. Uh, on the panel, we have John Desmond. John Desmond is the Information Technology Senior Manager with over 26 years at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, he's, developed, he's responsible for development and delivery of the benchmarking services to ELFA, the CEPA, and the industry, and the law firm survey. Um, led the platform selection and development of the CEPA survey and report, including the new products now um, should be right here. Hope everybody can see the screen. Um, so right now we're on basically the the uh, ELFA website, the Survey of Equipment Finance section. And on here has everything to do with the Survey of Equipment Finance, everything you wanted to know. So if you scroll down, right now the questionnaire is out. So um, right now we're, uh, it's for the 2019 survey. And if you're very, very interested in some of the data, please, um, please respond. This is the condensed questionnaire. So it's a good way to get the report and get the MyCETA, which John's going to demonstrate in a second, for free. Um, and we're, we're doing a webinar right now. All, all the reports accessible, the dashboard's accessible. Um, here's a little bit about the MySIFA, Sean will go over in a second, and the options to order. Um, everybody that participated in the survey of the equipment finance activity receives a copy for free, and they receive their individual company data sheet, and a custom, which is kind of a customized report um, with all the benchmarks for their specific company. Uh, I want to show you the dashboard really quick. So on the CIFA webpage, you go to the interactive dashboard. And here's some tips on using it, but I want to actually go to the dashboard. So the dashboard um, is available to all members, whether you participate or not. You just have to log in. It's got 10 years of executory summary data. Uh, well, it's 11 years now. And I'll go over it a little bit um, on a high level. And the my company, the MySEPA, also follows the same type of structure in terms of um, uh, in terms of how to dissect it and cut the information, things like that. So I'm going to go over it right now. So here you have basically uh, the dashboard. I'm going to go over to the yield spreads cost of fund section. And you'll be able to see right now we're looking at yield cost of funds for, um, it looks like for organization type for all segments. So right now it's look like, it looks like it's about five years. What I can do is I can kind of pull the bar and look at it over a 10-year trend. Why I like to show the slide is because over 10 years, everybody's always complained about margin compression, and you can see margins have compressed uh, for the most part, except those independents, which their margins have, you know, it's pretty much stayed strong. So I always like to show this. Uh, one of the things you can do is if you pull down this little category down here, you can look at it by type of organization, by market segment, um, which is by ticket size, by size of organization, by business model. Um, you can look at it by all those different things. So every single tab, you can dissect it all those different ways. You can dissect it by years, market segment, 
And here, if you just wanted to see um, just one, just the three, you can go and pull that and it'll pull the information for you and you can kind of take a look and see the information. Um, it's very customizable, um, 10 years, top level format. Um, every member can receive this information. So I am going to pass it on to John, who's going to demo the MySIPA. All right. <clears throat> Let me take control here. You should now see the uh, the individual company data sheet. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, John. Okay. Thanks, Bill. And also thank you to everyone in attendance. So today I'll give a brief background and look at the new MyCFA dashboard which was introduced last year as a beta release and sent to all CIFA participants back in December. Only survey participants are eligible to receive the My CIFA dashboard. Now, before we get into the dashboard, let's first have a look at its genesis, the individual company data sheets, or simply the ICDS. I presume most folks are familiar with this report as it's been provided to CIFA survey participants now for over 15 years. The ICDS gives respondents unique benchmark comparisons of their reported data against several cross sections of the survey. On the screen is a sample 2018 ICDS report. <clears throat> Excuse me. It contains about 20 pages with over 100 metrics focusing on the most recent fiscal year of reported data. The report is delivered in PDF file format. There are four sections of metrics in the report new business volume, financial measures, operational measures, benchmarks, and then the small ticket. Moving to page three, it starts up with new business volume and funding information for each metric going across. Your company value is presented first, followed by aggregate results for five comparison groups as follows. First group is always going to be the overall survey. Then you'll have organization type, which I'm sure you all know it's bank captive or independence by market segment, which is small, middle or large ticket. By organization size, which is determined by annual volume. You've got uh, four categories there under 50 million, 50 to 250 million and 250 million to 1 billion and then greater than 1 billion. And then by business model, which is determined by origination channel. There we have direct, vendor, third party, and mixed. Your company data is presented and it's benchmarked against each of the five comparison groups for each metric. You'll see your company rank and the metrics respondent count for each corresponding group. The group statistics presented include average or weighted average, depending on the metric, and then your 25th percentile, your median, and your in your 75th percentile or quartiles. So looking at this report, you can see the format remains the same and it's uh, throughout and it's, uh, it repeats itself over and over. It's quite number intensive as you can see. And remember this report, it's distributed each year to participants and it only contains results for the most recently reported fiscal year. Now, switching over to the MyCFA dashboard, a key differentiator is that it contains five years of your ICDS reports rolled into a single interactive file that includes graphical visualizations of the results not found in the ICDS report. Data can be viewed either by year or trending across years and with one or more comparison groups displayed side by side. In the past, you'd have to open each PDF report and spend copious amounts of time and effort to render something comparable. The dashboard technology in place is a software product called Tableau. Users are required to install a free Tableau Reader desktop application in order to view their file. The navigation is pretty straightforward. You simply click on the desired section at the top to move around within the dashboard. The introduction page 
It provides general information about the dashboard and displays the company name along with five comparison groups that are included. These groups are tailored to your company profile. The contents page lists the categories and metrics is included within and follow the same order as they appear in the ICDS report. Next is the results by year page. I'll start by covering the filters here on the left. They include um, the year, the user can select any year from 2013 to 2017. So there's five years of historical data packed into this dashboard. Category are, uh, provides the five categories of metrics we just looked at. And the metric filter provides an ordered list of metrics within each category. Short names appear in the drop-down list here and longer, more descriptive names will appear on the chart title when selected. On the groups filter, you can select up to five groups you'd like to see presented. Further below, on the legend, shades of blue indicate the percentiles and the red, the red bar indicates your company value. The black bars that you see represent the selected metrics average or weighted average for each group. So looking at this chart at the top, your company value is, is represented by the, by the solid red bar up here, which spans across the selected groups. Percentiles are presented as the blue diamonds. The lighter blue represents the 75th percentile. The middle blue is a median and the dark blue is the 25th percentile for each group. In short, a percentile is a number cutoff. For example, one fourth of the data lies above the 75th percentile. Similarly, one quarter of the data lies below the 25th percentile. The 50th percentile is by definition the median with half of the data lying above it and half below it. The average or weighted average for the selected metric is represented here again by the black bars going across. In the table below, you'll find company values, rank, and then an out of value, which is the, uh, the metric count, your average and your uh, percentiles. So, in this example, what does this chart mean? My sample company's new business volume value is the red line, which is well above the 75th percentile average and, and 25th percentile for both groups. With a rank of 19 in the overall group, I outperform my peers in the survey. This is what we expect as the leasing, equipment leasing industry is dominated by a limited number of large companies when looking at new business volume. So as you can see, there's clearly a lot to explore across multiple years on this page. The next page is the trending, which displays a mix of line graphs for the group results and your company values as vertical bars across multiple years. Filters on the left include the year range, which covers 2013 to 2017 and it is adjustable. The category, metric, and groups filters are the same as before. The statistic filter is a new twist in the trending that allows you to specify which group statistic you'd like to see line charted. You can see you can, uh, you can go with, uh, you can line chart the average or any one of the percentiles. Regardless of which statistic you're, you're charting, the table at the bottom will contain the full set of statistics. They're always displayed down here. The legend will identify each selected group within a sign color for the line chart. So looking at the chart on the top, group data for the selected metric and statistic is line charted across the range of years specified. In contrast, your company data is shown as these vertical gray bars for each year. On the table below, the leftmost column displays the selected groups. For each group, you'll see your company value, you'll see the average or the weighted average, and you see your percentiles. 
So on the previous dashboard, we saw that our 2017 new business volume was ranked 19th overall. Here we see that over time, our new business volume has changed and jumped significantly in 2017. As we, and we see that our 1.7 billion in new business volume, it's much higher than the overall average indicated by the blue line. But when looking at a smaller competitive middle ticket set, the orange line, though our performance is better than the average, the average is closer to our performance in this subgroup. Just to show you the, uh, how you can chart different, you can display and chart different, um, different statistics here. So the last page is a uh, respondents page, which shows all CFA respondents by year and organization type. The blue squares indicate presence of company data for the corresponding year. So this completes a brief look at the MyCIFA dashboard. I hope you all found it useful. A reminder that all CIFA survey participants have already received their 2018 MyCIFA dashboard file. If you have any questions or would like additional info about the dashboards or even the ICDS report, please reach out to Bill Choi at the ELFA. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, just remember also, the dashboard's available to um, all members, whether you participate or not, it's a nice ben member benefit. Also, to participate in the um, in the survey, it's of no charge. It's also a nice member benefit. To get the MySeFA report, though, you definitely have to uh, participate because your company's data in there, and the longer you participate, you know, you five years, you get five years of benchmarking data. So, um, the the longer you participate, the better it's going to be. Um, I wanted to introduce our next speaker. Here's the story of the story of an accidental CIFA subject matter expert. Uh, Mike Harris, then president of the Maryland National, National Leasing uh, uh, Company, was, able to, was unable to attend the um, association's research committee. Mike called upon a young apprentice and newly append, appended, newly minted MBA with bank correction training to go in his place. When that young MBA returned from the research committee, Mike Harris asked how it went, and that young MBA admitted he was lost among a committee of uh, seasoned accountants. Too bad, Mike said. Now you're permanently on the research committee. And that was 1982, and that young leasing apprentice was David Wiener. Fast forward eight years, um, a new research committee chairman um, discovered he wasn't able to lead the upcoming research committee. Ralph Petta at the time, uh, vice president of research, was desperate. He conjoled David Wiener, the longest serving research committee member, to lead the committee just one time. For the, for, the, for the next 17 years, David Wiener served as chairman of the uh, ELFA Research Committee. He indirectly mentored the next two research committees, Jerry Jordan and Ray James, both of, us, both of them which is, ex, uh, earned the highest, uh, ELFA's highest service honor, the Michael J. Fleming Award, which David Wiener is also a recipient of. Um, David joined the committee in 1982. The report was 16 pages in PICA-type font with no graphs. He stepped down 25 years later, and the report has expanded over 300 pages. During his tenure, the uh, research chairman and the ELFA launched the Monthly Leasing Finance Index, which refers to uh, the MILFI, and has been featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, touting as a leading indicator of U.S. health and, and economy. Uh, since 2010, Dave's been part of a, a Alta Group, 75-member worldwide consulting firm, which is dedicated to servicing equipment finance companies exclusively. He's conducted work through interpreters in Spanish, French, Japanese, Russian, Chinese uh, remarks today will be in English. <laughs> and, um, and Dave's role as Chief Research and Information Officer to firm relies on his industry research and has become a master user of the ELFA Survey of Equipment Finance Activity. Today he'll give us a sneak peek behind his curtain on what, uh, what he does with the data and how we can harness the power of the CIFA. Uh, this is a sample of the product of work of some 4,000 hours of his data research over the past nine years. David, it's all yours. Thank you, Bill. Uh, looking forward to exploring the uh, how we can use the CIFA data. Uh, first, need to give you a little bit of a, a disclaimer. Um, I have uh, attempted to make sure that all this data is accurate, that it is all from the Survey of Equipment Finance Activity itself, uh, but I do need to add the disclaimer that the LFA, the Alter Group, and me as the author cannot accept any responsibility for using comments or the advice that you might hear today. 
uh, basically you're on your own. So I do need to add that uh, on behalf of our, my legal team. Um, the, uh, the 2018 survey was released in June and we're talking about this today since we really want the peak interest to uh, participate in the 2019 survey. Um, as Bill mentioned uh, and John mentioned, uh, companies who participate get a complimentary compre, uh, copy, but if you don't participate in the questionnaire, you can still purchase one, but you ain't getting the uh, individual company data sheets that uh, John uh, uh, unpacked for us a few minutes ago. Uh, you know, I I've, I've pondered in the time that I've been on the committee why companies don't participate. Uh, and I think they follow what the late uh, Stephen Covey, who authored The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, would call uh, following the law of the school versus the law of the farm. Uh, a farmer must plant in the spring to expect a crop in the fall. But when we're in high school or college, we sometimes can uh, cram and get by for that final exam. And I think that uh, there are some organizations that might delegate or dump completion of this questionnaire to an unknowing or unwitting junior member of the company, and they wait until the last minute to discover that they really need to roll up their sleeves and spend a fair amount of time on the questions, the accuracy of it, and they need to uh, leverage the information from other stakeholders within their organization. So uh, um, it's good to start early, and uh, it's good to be, uh, be thorough along the way. Um, when I work with uh, clients uh, using CIFA data, um, it's my responsibility to make it really relevant for them and to maybe unpack it as a story. Um, that is, what does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? Or what, so what, and now what? Um, with We've got a lot of folks on this call today that might represent some banks, some capital, some independents, some direct or vendor or third-party originators or small, mid, or large ticket funders primarily, and I would really be hard pressed to be able to, in a half hour window, offer much of a customized survey. So I am at risk of doing more of a data bump, dump, so you might get wet, but instead I'm gonna follow what I'm gonna call the little pink spoon strategy. Uh, did you know that uh, former President Barack Obama and uh, actress Julia Roberts uh, uh, actually were at one time working at Baskin Robbins. Um, I won't stuff you with a free hot fudge banana split, but my job is to give you a taste of Rocky Road and chocolate chip and just hope that you buy in and uh, and maybe give you some uh, hidden insights along the way. Um, did you ever look at the Baskin Robbins emblem, for instance? Did you know that there are 31 flavor trademark is right in the middle of the B and the R? Uh, and they have made sure that kind of sublimely comes through in their brand. When uh, I uh, started work on the uh, the survey, it was a 16-page report. Uh, these are uh, two of the more exciting pages. Uh, no graphs, very few charts. Uh, and by the way, the pages were actually printed in yellow to start. It's not the age of the report that I that I have, but it has really come a long way. Um, I realized that uh, reports on data points must be pulled from a myriad of years, not just the current year. If you want to identify trends, you want to track the survey data, particularly looking at it over one or more ec economic cycles, you need to dig back into the archives and use uh, a dozen or so more uh, years. Um, the, the graphs uh, that, uh, that I pulled do uh, capture information that would be just before the Great Recession. Um, now, when I walk through some of the reports at the moment, what I have done is included at the bottom the source of the data, and I have attempted to include the current uh, year source of the chart number and page number cited from the 2018 CIFA survey. Um, you know, I, I guess my, I need to add one more warning to be really careful not to sophomorically conjecture broad conclusions based on simple surface scan of the CIFA data. I own a boat uh, and I've had uh, the pleasure of having the LFA president and past chairman on board. It is actually my favorite place to uh, hold a consulting meeting because uh, you can't get away unless you walk on water. 
but when navigating, it is really wise to triangulate your positioning, to chart a course, and not to rely on just one data point, or otherwise, you really have a risk of traveling in a circle or running aground. Now, my little 28 foot might be forgiving in shallow water, but not so much on a football field long container ship, which is one that uh, when I was uh, much younger, I actually uh, tapped captain taking it right through the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And fortunately, you can see here, you want to stay in this channel. My boat can go here and here, but this boat sure can't. Ultimately, the CIFA data should be cross-validated with a myriad of other resources. Uh, top of the list for me would be the Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA reports. Other independent sources will include IBIS World, First Research, the American Institute of CPAs, AICPA, the Monitor 100, Paynet Data, World Leasing Yearbook, the co-sponsored ELFA IM Investor Conference, the ELFA What's Hot, What's Not report, Maybe closer to home would be the MILFI 25, the confidence index that the foundation publishes, and then the ELFA Finance Foundation commissioned periodic reports, the economic outlook and the investment momentum under the Keybridge provides, the Horizon report, the U.S. Equipment Finance Market Study and uh, that IHS Marquis has done, as well as other uh, foundation research and white papers. Um, a relevant contrast worth exploring to see a cycle in industry is uh, is looking at the data over a uh, longer than a one or two year comparison. You want to look at things in good times and bad, the underlying performance, and then try to investigate the root cause. Um, what I've snapshot here is the 2007 and 2017 fiscal year end data, respectively the 2008 and the 2018 survey of equipment finance activity. Now you'll see here over half of the equipment leased fall into three general classifications. Transportation, and that's going to include air, marine, rail, trucks, trailers, buses, IT, and construction. The go-to-market strategy is going to vary widely by collateral types. Uh, transportation alone, you've got trucks, trailers that will be often in three to seven year track lease structures. Aircraft, you'll find a uh, ranging of a 7 to a 12-year fair market value term, longer if we're talking about commercial aircraft. Rail and marine intermodal is often split between short-term rentals and long-term leases. Now, we know that short-term leases and those with underlying bundled services are often uh, including managed, uh, uh, are often managed in such a way that they need to be proactively touched throughout the lease term versus longer term transactions which tend to enable the user lessee to have quiet enjoyment and the only follow-up by the lessor would be for either a new equipment or to uh, uh, inspect the equipment or maybe a year before the end of the lease term uh, get a read on the decision whether the lessee plans to renew or uh, uh, or purchase the equipment otherwise the lessor would need to begin uh, remarketing it IT equipment, you often find them in short-term transactions, and that's anything but quiet enjoyment. There's a cross-sell for trade-ups to new technology and other additional capacity that we, uh, a lessor sales team attempts to uh, sell to once that first lease is inked. Now, I could do a dumpster dive uh, of uh, for each of these equipment types, and there's going to be a number of un unique uh, upfront sales strategies that I could unpack. Uh, but uh, all we have time for today is this little uh, pink spoon taste uh, as we uh, as we kind of roll through uh, some of this data comparison. Uh, uh, but a lessor just can't look at equipment types. You need to also look at the economic factors facing each user lessee group, and that has to be kept in cons in the consideration with respect to market entry, sales strategy, and the underwriting protocol, even within sectors close examination is necessary before entry. Now, for instance, while brick and mortar retail is spotty as we watch uh, the likes of Sears and other retailers with the challenges they have, um, in the wholesale and retail sector, there's still some shining stars. I mean, Amazon alone is one of the largest and most active lessees. 
with an aggressive regional logistic build-out plan, and their equipment procurement needs are tremendous, but it's priced very aggressively. And while we may not have recommended uh, oil and gas market entry 24 years ago, we have observed a uh, rapid recovery there, particularly as the spot price for uh, sweet crude has gone up in the U.S. Looking at origination channels, uh, a full two-thirds of the equipment finance market is non-tax, that is, finance leases and loans, and by definition, that is not FMV, not fair market value, true leases, they're not. However, the third that does remain FMV often uh, has residual upside and has tax deferrals through depreciation, and therefore we know that well, lessees are able to get lower monthly payments as a result, or sidestep some of the AMT needs that they may have had in the past. And while only 28% of bank lease transactions are fair market value, captive true leases are 40% of their originations, independents are 50%. However, the higher dollar volume of banks overall caused the, tr the overall true lease dollar volume for banks to weigh in and uh, bring them up from a 28 of themselves to 33% of the overall new business volume as reported within CIFA. Did I jump forward one too far? Yeah. Um, uh, looking at origination channels, direct origination uh, uh, market share has gone up appreciably with the growing competitive bank presence. Vendor program origination has made slight gains as well. Captives have appeared, at least in the current year, to have given up a little bit of market share. I think driving that decline could be some past recession factors, uh, uh, particularly those that have been in the agriculture community or those that have provided equipment to the mining and oil and gas sector. And it is common that in an environment of cheap bank money, money that captives are might be, might be a little more willing to abdicate financing to those that are clobbering one another over over rate or they might sell transactions wholesale or even syndicate at time of origination rather than keep them on their own books captive volume hit a market share high watermark in the 2009 and 2011 time frame when banks were facing liquidity challenges and for those captives to success successfully execute on the top line sales objectives of their parent, captive lessors were called upon in a much more significant way to support their parent company sales objectives. Now, that need for heavy lifting has waned somewhat. However, captives and others that are in the vendor space enjoy footprint control and downline down dealer satisfaction as they uh, uh, as that drives uh, the, the, their, their operation and their volume originations overall. The takeaways. Leasing, we know, should not be viewed as a single market with a single product or a single competitor profile. Good operators watch their dashboards carefully and, and they, with respect to end user trends and they look at it with respect to equipment demands prudent transaction structures, and corresponding lengths of lease term, as well as the unique characteristics of lessors who compete in the space. The fact that there is a high penetration in only a few equipment types uh, suggests to me that there is some make share opportunities that could be investigated. We know that copier leasing has a higher penetration as a percent of the overall equipment that's procured but in some of the other equipment categories, there is still runway. Product offerings, they have to be customer-centric with suitable and compelling structures and delivery channels. Uh, while customer-centric uh, should not be overlooked at the lesser operator, needs to know what they're doing, and any retool processes must, uh, must be done as well, which would be, include things like customer portals, vendor dashboards, so that uh, in an era where people want to do a little more self-serve, uh, they're able to see the, um, their interaction uh, in a more visible way with the, uh, the leasing companies that serve them. In some years, uh, bad residual bets have haunted lessors more than underwriting. Uh, this might also include omitting 
important maintenance per, uh, requirements, return provisions, or uh, failure to get UCC uh, informational filings to uh, make sure that they have equipment control and that all know that they're the owner of it. Uh, and I think that the chase for volume at times may have blinded a few firms that miss warning signs, such as what challenged uh, ag and energy a few years ago, and even blemishes in the credit scoring algorithms that, uh, that, that came to home to roost in the 2009 Great Recession. Banks capped as independents, we know they're different, but just specifically, how are they different and how may they go about their business? There has been one statistical, I'll call it special cause variation to use my uh, Six Sigma quality background that has created a seismic shift in the volume trends between these three company categories. Uh, you see banks are gone up, you've seen captives stay a bit flat after a spike from 07 to 12, but you see independents have had some stair steps down. The transition of GE Capital, which for years was the number one lessor, and they define themselves as independent. They have now transformed their organization into a captive focused on equipment with GE manufactured content. So they have moved out of that independent space, which uh, accounts for the lion's share of that percentage market share drop. Uh, in the uh, independent category. Um, this chart looks at the historical ROA and ROE. Uh, there's uh, uh, the, the 2009 dip in ROA and ROE resulted from, I think, the, what I'll call the sound the alarms build up in the portfolio loss reserves. Uh, the 2010 recovery was the product of a dramatic increase in transaction spreads in the immediate aftermath of the greatest liquidity drought that we've had in 80 years. But starting in 2009, the Federal Reserve flooded the market, low, interest, low Fed funds rates, they had excess liquidity, quantum easing, banks were flush with cash to lend, rates got low, and competition pushed rate spreads, pushed spreads to get thin. But ROA and ROE seem to have normalized. Uh, uh, and yet they're normalized even in a thin spread, spread environment. Uh, I think the scant spreads have translated to, to, could have translated to skimpy ROAs and ROEs, but that was masked since the industry could take a pause in booking further loss reserves given the uh, over-reserving that occurred in 2009-2010. Now, now, what caused the spike in ROA and ROE in 2017? Uh, can't speak on the phone, but uh, maybe in your mind, can you guess? The 2018 tax law that we ratified in 2017 reduced the federal tax rate for corporations from 34% to 20%. So built up deferred taxes from equipment depreciation on leased equipment resulted in a one-time adjustment. That ain't happening again. Real ROA and real ROE performance will be evident for fiscal year 2018 in the 2019 CIFA report. Stay tuned. Now, ROA and RA really should be looked at by the 13 peer groups, the three company sizes, the three ticket group sizes, the three origination channels, and the four overall company size categories, all in the annual survey report. Uh, this just gives you just one, which is banks. It shows a 17-year trend of cost of funds, yeah. yield, spreads, and it shows current year ROA and ROE. The, um, uh, I've added a factor which I call efficiency, which is the sales general administrative expenses as a percent of adjusted revenue. The lower, the more efficient the organization is. And this is quite a telling trend, and there's a wealth of insights when seen historically and parsed among those 13 groups. These are a couple ways to show the same information in terms of pre tax yield, cost of funds, and spread. This floor blocker. Uh, shows it uh, separating banks, captives, and independents. This next chart groups all, uh, pre tax yield of those three groups together, the cost of funds of those three groups together, and then the spreads together. Interesting to see that independents have been able to have better stickiness within, with keeping their, uh, their, their rates up, but then they have generally a much higher cost of funds. Um, my suspicion is that banks, that independents are able to uh, play in a wider range 
of transaction types, uh, a wider range in uh, in credit quality that allows them to uh, to maybe maneuver a little more than the way a, a, a bank or organization may. The uh, I would take a, a, a I'd recommend that a client take and look at industry financial ratios and performance overall as well as by their sector and look at it historically because a single year uh, may have some outliers. So I would take my company and use the individual company data sheet, but I would also look at the profitability dynamics over a, a, a five or 10 year period of time, particularly including a time when we've gone through an economic cycle like we did in 2000 and, um, 2009, 2010. What are the takeaways here? Banks have been dominate, but will that continue in an era of rising cost of funds? Captives will continue their mission to serve the parent company, uh, and this may, however, utilize cheaper bank rates, uh, and they may continue to do a sell down, in which case their market share would not increase. And we're seeing that good independent operators will survive, in our opinion, given their innovation and their focus and their specialty. Um, yet, it, many independents will continue to be acquisition uh, candidates for those that are looking to grow and have capital to play with. Portfolio quality. Uh, this is a simple, if you just take a simple stare at the current prior year, this doesn't cut it when you want to look at portfolio trends. An aha moment comes when uh, shown ge uh, graphically, uh, particularly if you're able to reach back prior to the, uh, the last re Great Recession. And what do you see here? Uh, there's us in 2017. There's a slight uh, jump in the net charge offs, but the 30 day delinquencies are actually almost on par with what we saw in 2009 when the economy really was challenged. And, and oh, uh, um, non accruals have gone, gone up too. Is that an anomaly? Be interesting to see what happens in this year's report. Perhaps this adds a little more context. Uh, are there causes and effect factors connecting approval percentages to problem accounts? Notice the uh, the past due spike was concentrated in um, in in captives uh, right here, um, but yet they tend to run with higher delinquencies overall because customers may forget that. They, as lessees, are, have a hell of a high water lease with the lessor captive, and they may uh, be tempted to hold a payment hostage if there's an equipment performance problem or something that needs service and attention. And captives do have a margin to play with with the manufacturer. As, as a result, they traditionally show a higher pr approval percentage than do uh, banks and, uh, and independents uh, because of their do-all-my-deals mindset that they um, must serve. It's driven by the mantra of their of the dealers that they are looking to serve. A lot of information behind this, but we have 30 minutes, not three hours. Um, I would suggest uh, taking a, uh, a, a adopting the practice of showing historical portfolio trends within in your peer groups. One thing I would do is also look at the 60 day delinquency versus 30 days, and that would eliminate first payment delinquency factors and some of the administrative noise that, uh, that, uh, that, that often is found in the 30-day environment. Um, taking a look at the ticket size, mid-ticket continues to pr comprise the majority of volume booked. Large ticket is in a more limited range, uh, but they are, have more limited equipment types, plants, aircraft, vessels, facilities. Small ticket is interesting in the arrival of FinTech equipment finance providers and the unique competition that they face from other procurement means, such as corporate credit cards on the small end of the, uh, of the finance spectrum. Um, I would take a client through what I'm going to call four blocker, which is uh, looking at, uh, at uh, volume. And you'll see in the volume here, uh, in, in years prior to 2014, the LFA parsed small ticket from micro ticket, micro ticket being under uh, $25,000 per transaction, a uh, small ticket being under 250,000. Those groups were merged together in, uh, in the 2014 fiscal year end numbers. Um, the, uh, historically, uh, the historical ROA uh, is, is showing as here as well, the, uh, 
uh, the spike from, we think, from the deferred tax windfall that uh, could be monetized for fiscal year 2017. And while generally stable, there has been an increase in delinquencies, particularly the past two years. Top six equipment types, ag, IT, office copiers, construction, medical, trucks, and trailers. Uh, good takeaways. Good small ticket operators are highly automated, and uh, they use technology to ensure their efficiencies are realized. Many are vendor-oriented. Mid-ticket is split between direct and vendor, and their, tick, their deal size represents active bank commercial loan referrals within each institution, and there is an active uh, one-off buy-sell syndication market. And while not as large, large-ticket lessors are experiencing a rebirth as the result of some new entrants, a comeback in the demand for certain equipment types, and some new entrants who are highly structured players who are pursuing higher rate, higher structured transactions. Fair market value lease experience. Uh, to to uh, paraphrase Mark Twain, the demise of the fair market value true lease transaction is greatly exaggerated. Banks, captives, and independents are all active in offering a tax-motivated true lease product. On average, there is a gain on sale at the end of lease term with the realized residual exceeding the amount booked. However, that gain has been trending down. There are a lot of reasons for this. First, you are just seeing the macro view here. Um, working with clients, we would examine the micro view, that would be yours, uh, and uh, 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 an assessment of uh, asset management strategy really is a, a interesting uh, strategy overall. Um, the uh, quick takeaways, we know that FMB has not gone away. Banks, captives, and independents make, do make a, a market here. Uh, and it might be prudent uh, for a, a company to do a proactive audit of asset management practices from residual setting to documented use conditions and then end of term remarketing. That would also be a, a recommendation. Um, the reason why you may not see uh, the same level of gain on sale is, include factors such as either higher residual that's booked or perhaps there is uh, more competition of new equipment that's being uh, purchased that is more competitive than uh, staying with, uh, with used equipment. We're seeing uh, there continue to be greater competition among lessors and therefore a need to be a, a little bit more uh, sharper pencil with respect to uh, the residual that's booked. I find that CIFA does offer some powerful industry information, and I, I think I've, uh, I'll be, admit that I've basically just barely scratched the surface in exploring, exploring the content on, the, on this call. I would boil this down to three steps. One, uh, we've talked today about what does it say, the information within CIFA. Um, uh, within many companies, it is the CEO or the individual who's completed the survey that just thumbs through the report. And that is just thumbing. Um, I would discourage stopping there. The slower simmering process is the contemplation of what does it mean or what are the implications that can be drawn from CIFA data. And the real fruit is the third step. That is, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to my company? Uh, what is the application of the data? Um, there's just so much that could be harnessed here. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think that many might be stumped, just as I was uh, when I walked into my first uh, research committee meeting in 1982. Um, you want your company to be more efficient? I think that CIFA can help. If you want to ascertain if the capital charge assessed by your parent uh, bank treasury has too much of a premium, I think that CIFA can help. Is your staffing in line? Do you want to ponder new business uh, entry areas, new products, uh, alternate delivery channels, or offer financing of additional equipment types? Uh, yep, there again, CIFA can help. But why don't we? Um, from my experience, when I'm brought in to help a client, it's clear that uh, companies have to run a leasing business. It is their day job to solicit, bid, win, approve, document, book, fund, and service customers. And uh, making heads or tails out of CIFA and other relevant data 
takes time. Uh, time is probably our most important and most precious commodity. Um, and that time can be protracted when you need to go through a slow, tenacious process of assimilating the data. And that's further stalled when you don't know what to look at or where to find it, or you don't have the historical data to work from. I will say that leasing trade associations in other parts of the world are in awe that the ELFA successfully produces the details and the granular information that, uh, that is in the survey of equipment finance activity. And they've done so for over 40 years. Uh, now, from today's little pink taste spoon, which is the free stuff, I hope you are amazed at what CIFA can do for you. And this might help open up uh, your eyes as to how you might be able to use it within your organization. Bill, back to you. Thank you, David. Um, the most number one question that people have been asking are, are the slides going to be available? Um, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, the webinar will be posted right after it's done. So please, if you guys have any questions, you can uh, post it to the chat. If you hover over to the bottom of the screen, um, uh, you, you should be able to access the chat function. So I'll give it a couple of minutes to see if there's any questions for you, David, or about anything else. And also, the participation is going on right now. I showed you on the on the first screen on the SEPA marketing on the SEPA page. Um, the questionnaire is up there. Please participate. We'd love to get you guys involved. And a lot of the stuff is all a member benefit. It comes with your your dues, so it's a free service. There's no charge at all. So please participate. I'm not seeing any questions. I think uh, surprisingly it is 12.54 right now and we are under the limit here. So uh, we plan for an hour and um, I'll give it another minute or two and then we can adjourn. All right, thank you guys for participating. Thank you, John, thank you, David. Thank you guys for uh, coming out to see all the wonderful things SEPA has to offer and all the historical trends and um, look forward to seeing everybody soon. So thank you guys. <laughs>